right? Um, okay, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, welcome everyone to our first book launch of our department that is co-organized by uh, the University of Lancaster, uh, Center for Social Justice and Wellbeing in Education. Uh, I want to thank both institutions, um, you know, for making this event uh, very possible and also above all, of course, I want to thank to uh, the co-editors of this very brilliant volume and all the contributors. Um, I think this is um, feminist framing of Europeanization, okay. gender equality, and the EU uh, is a very timely contribution to the literature. It involves um, many important uh, stalemate uh, aspects of, you know, Turkey-EU relations, but beyond that, it bridges the literature also um, of uh, European Union, Europeanization, feminist studies, and of course, like the impasse of Turkey and EU relations. So it is, uh, it tackles with like a very difficult uh, multidimensional um, problems, right? S a set of problems, um, but in a very brilliant way, I must say. So I congratulate before we start all the contributors to the volume. Um, this is, um, a very, I think, um, important contribution to various literatures. And particularly at the time when we are discussing like um, um, all these challenges related to gender security, gender inequality, uh, let aside Turkey-EU relations, right? When I was a PhD student, and I think it was in 2002, um, we had in one of our PhD colloquium, uh, we had uh, Claudio Radelli, who had introduced um, this concept of Europeanization. And he was very young by then. He was a scholar at University of Pisa and he was with us, you know, talking the, you know, about Europeanization, how he conceptualized and we were like, wow, I mean, we wanna be like him one day. And it just, I see that, uh, you know, his um, concept of Europeanization I think um, has, um, you know, um, had a very successful development in the literature. So, and um, well, I, I don't want to take too much time because we have like um, brilliant women and, you know, men, of course, as contributors to this volume here with us. We have the students, we have colleagues. So everybody is actually looking forward to you know, hearing what they will tell about the, uh, their contributions in the book. But before that, I think maybe you will mention or not, even though the EU itself uh, has fallen short of like a serious progress in this, uh, you know, field of, uh, you know, gender equality in, in international relations in EU politics. Uh, recently, there was an important session, important voting at the European Parliament um, on feminist forum on adapting feminist uh, foreign policy. And uh, well, this proposal that was on the agenda of the parliament uh, was voted with like a, a majority approval for a gender equal foreign and security policy. So this is, I think, a very serious step beside all the UN efforts to provide gender in, in women empowerment in foreign policy um, various EU member states have uh, had a remarkable progress in this field, even though there is like a lot of things that remain still underdeveloped in major part of the world. Well, apparently gender equality in politics um, is one of these challenges that we have to think more and talk more. And uh, I want to stop here while we'll hear, um, you know, much more valuable insights. Um, so, uh, I want to stop here. I want to briefly talk about the, um, the program that uh, I'll give floor to uh, the editors and then um, some of their uh, contributors are here with us. So um, they will be sharing their uh, views, their, um, some info about the chapters. And then we have a discussant, Ebru Turhan from a Turkish um, uh, German uh, University. So Ebru Turhan will give us like um, a very detailed account uh, of the book. 
And again, I mean, I want to thank everyone for your very valuable participation. And now I start enjoying, you know, your talks. So uh, I finished my part. So the floor is yours. If you have any questions or comments, please, everyone in the audience, you can just type it there in the chat box. At the very end, uh, we'll give some space to your contribution as well. All right, so Rahime. Uh, Rahime Uja, let me introduce first Rahime. Uh, she has recently joined our department and we're very glad to have her with us. Uh, she's done, you know, at, at her very young age, she's done really in a remarkable academic career. Uh, so I'm very glad that you joined our team. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, Rahime, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ebro Jam. I, I'm also quite happy to be uh, with our department with you. And thank you very much for this nice introduction of both our book and myself. So I will be um, uh, starting with our, uh, you know, where we approach, like why we decided and uh, how this idea came about. So first of all, I would like to highlight that uh, just like you, uh, you, you know, this framework of Europeanization was once and still quite a passion of me. I did my PhD on that. And then our research interests, of course, developed. So the, this book is actually an outcome of myself uh, as the, you know, um, uh, my knowledge and expertise on EU studies. And uh, it, uh, it was uh, significantly enriched with Melis expertise on feminist theory and gender studies. So uh, the idea of this book came with our uh, Jean Monnet module, Women's Development and Europeanization of Gender Policies which we had run uh, from 2017 to, to 2020. Uh, 20, so we just completed in August. And uh, so as, as part of this project, we taught uh, undergraduate and postgraduate courses entitled Gender Policies uh, and the European Union uh, through a flipped classroom uh, methodology. So we used a wi wide variety of techniques uh, for teaching, learning, and assessment. So we, uh, we uh, expanded our discussion on EU gender equality and its impact on Turkey. And also we have quite, um, you know, learned quite a lot from our students, their uh, critical analysis of both the EU and the feminism and the different uh, perceptions about both of them. So I would like to extend my gratitude to my students initially who have, um, you know, provided extensive, super extensive discussions for their super active participation in, in the classes. And secondly, uh, I would like to emphasize um, in a feminist, um, you know, book and also in a feminist research that uh, was very valuable both for me and for Melis is that we selected our contributors um, to an open call democratically. So we did not really make this a commission work so we distributed to an open core uh, called from directorate to all the universities in turkey that's why that's how we actually came to you know uh, bring extensive uh, you know a, an interdisciplinary book uh, as we have contributors from departments such as public administration finance and business administration which are not directly in you know dealing with europeanization or uh, gender uh, equality or gender studies or feminist theory so that was uh, for us the richness of this volume and uh, that is what we are very happy uh, to be uh, so the, it started with a workshop that we organized in april 2016 uh, which took in the form of ex expansion and uh, our expansion of our thoughts so in the in the workshop and in the throughout this book uh, we had uh, we sought to uh, resolve a particular puzzle. And this puzzle actually started with a, a report uh, of the European Parliament's policy department, uh, which we were all, all already understanding from this literature, but the report indicated that uh, six uh, EU member states, uh, namely Hungary, Austria, Italy, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia, they have gen uh, backlash in gender equality policies. So. So this brought um, a lot of discussion among, amongst us. And so it, it reports that it actually shows that, you know, when the membership has been granted, then, you know, these, all these legislative changes can uh, go to backlash, so they can be reversed. So they can be basically gender equality norms can be abandoned once uh, they have been adopted as a legislative procedure, uh, as such like harmonization. 
So our immediate reaction to this was initially that because they have already attained membership, which is the most significant incentive, obviously, uh, in, highlighted in the Europeanization framework, that they approach this gender equality issue as a tick box exercise to meet legislation. And then once they got this, you know, the highest reward of membership, then they can fall back. So this is how we, um, you know, start to think. And then, uh, of course, then the, the most uh, significant milestone is perhaps that if it is still um, a candidate, uh, just like Turkey, uh, we should keep on momentum, like Europeanization should have continued, but there shouldn't be backlash. So this justifies our choice of Turkey, apart from all us being Turkish, that justifies our thought of, you know, uh, being, um, uh, by the way, I'm not sure if uh, this is being recorded, uh, maybe to reminder. Okay, so, uh, so this justifies our approach to um, um, selection of Turkey as a case study. Uh, but we want to focus on, you know, in order to develop a feminist framework of Europeanization, uh, we wanted to highlight, um, you know, that you, know, you might think that a comparative case would be better, but we wanted to control all these legal uh, and cultural and social factors. So, so we selected Turkey as a case study because also um, it has very long lasting relations that can actually help us to map different dimensions of and the variables of Europeanization. And also um, we thought that Turkey would be the most likely to be Europeanized in gender equality policy because um, the position of women is like uh, approached as an emblem of Turkey's modernity. And uh, so that's why we chose Turkey. And also that we have very, strong feminist movement and I think Elif will talk more about this so I don't want to uh, go more go on to much into detail of it so basically uh, by, uh, by this uh, you know, taking this book as a um, you know, Turkey as the case study in this book we want to uh, approach and understand the problematic gender equality understanding of the EU with the EU driven mechanisms and then concept, we uh, subsequently developed a feminist framework, which maybe we'll talk more about it, uh, drawing on the works of key feminist philosophers like Carol Patman, Honor O'Neill, Nancy Fraser, Anna Philip Ellis, uh, Iris Young, and Marta Nussbaum. So uh, there are two main criticisms that is, this framework offers, actually. So in the Europeanization framework, we talk a lot about the, you know, the adoption of the gender equality policies as a cost-benefit assessment. And the feminist literature criticizes this from the point that whose interests we are talking about, whose rationality is that, uh, are, is there a leg legitimacy in that because is there any equal participation of women? Uh, so can we actually talk about like in the cost benefit assessment, whose benefit is that we are talking about? And if that, you know, uh, an alternative mechanism, uh, social learning is that looking at the EU directives and legis uh, apart from the legislative uh, mechanisms that, you know, the political elites could socialized into and persuaded about the gender equality norms at the EU level uh, because they will actively participate in the EU sponsored mechanisms. So, but then uh, the feminist literature and uh, talks about, uh, you know, that what kind of interactions that we are talking about here because these interactions are usually conducted in male dominated arenas and previous research on gender in EU studies and also our research up to date has shown that you know, uh, the EU's is all, own institutions uh, lacks from gender equality, um, I mean, lack of equal representation. Uh, so uh, in this case, you know, what kind of a gender equality they are talking about without taking into account the perceptions, experiences, and interests of women, which are um, not represented quite well. Uh, so we talk, uh, our overall argument in this book is that, um, you know, um, because it bears a feminist agenda, in gender equality agenda since the Treaty of Rome, uh, with the incorporation of equal pay for equal work in 1957, European Union has done much to promote gender equality. But then we argue that it remains a progressive gender actor rather than being a normative gender actor or a feminist actor. Uh, and we analyze this throughout uh, 13 chapters um, 
in different subcases uh, of the gender equality policies. And the, the first part uh, is about the uh, theoretical and conceptual development. So Didam and me in chapter two talks about the literature on Europeanization and how it is applied to gender equality policies so far. And then we move on to Dimitris Anagnostakis, analysis of the EU's gender, uh, foreign policy and um, promotion of gender equality through external relations. And um, so uh, he looks at the framing of gender equality in the different documents. And then uh, we, uh, and me and Melis, uh, developed the feminist framework in chapter four, which Melis will talk more about. And then we have uh, Buke, uh, who will, uh, Buke Boshnak, who will be talking about uh, the, how the EU's funding mechanisms and to civil society is actually um, approaching gender equality from an instrumental perspective. These are, um, you know, the, the conceptual framework which have already uh, developed, helped us develop a hypothesis, uh, a frame, uh, a hypothesis or a proposition perhaps that, you know, it will not be um, looking at the equality of outcomes in terms of gender equality. So the gender equality will remain selective, uh, be hypothesized from this conceptual framework. And now we move on to our second part of the book, which is the empirical analysis part. In, in this part, Elif Uzgaran uh, talked about how globalization and the EU membership process had affected women's rights and feminist movement in Turkey uh, over two decades. And uh, she analyzed how they perceived emancipation and shaped the strategies. Uh, to influence political sphere. Then we move on to, to Burcu Tashkin's analysis on the, the EU's roles in gender policy making and the adoption of the and application of the EU laws and um, how it actually encourages um, or uh, distracts coordination from the, uh, among different women MPs. And uh, then we move on to next chapter uh, by uh, Burcu Özdemir Sarıgül, who could not join us today, unfortunately. Uh, but she talked about the, the violence against women, which is a contentious issue, which makes our book quite timely. And I wish that she could join us, actually. Uh, she talked about the violence against women and the causal mechanisms uh, underway. Then we have... Uh, Gamze Şeran, Yıldız Şeran Kurular, uh, she's, uh, she uh, analyzed, um, you know, the representation, gender, gender responsive budgeting strategy and how it is applied in the, the national and local uh, governmental agenda. And she partially looked at the Tekirdağ Süleyman Paşa Municipality's approach to adoption of gender responsive budgeting uh, as a lesson uh, drawing mechanism. Then we move on to Mina uh, Pajan Fındıklı, Duygu Acer Ardur and Ayper Ustabash, which focused on gender equality in the private sector, and they analyzed um, women uh, managers and then how they actually perceive gender equality, whether they can actually observe the, the, the their rights, which actually have uh, they have in legislative framework and how they actually feel uh, this, these rights have been translated into their uh, business lives. And now we have John, uh, we have uh, uh, Melis Jin and uh, Ejam Khalida in this chapter on the EU's uh, role in the uh, transforming the education uh, curriculum in Turkey, so the education policies in Turkey, which I think Melis will mention more. And uh, we have Ezal Tabur's chapter, which is uh, the final chapter before our conclusion, which uh, looks uh, at uh, the migration management, use migration management issue and the, the strategy of externalization and how this issue have impacted um, different um, um, marginalized uh, refugee women uh, because uh, it left them to do uh, the fate decided by the policymakers, both in the EU and Turkey. And uh, this is, uh, I hope that I didn't exceed my time. I, I think I did, but thank you very much. I think um, this is what I will say. And uh, from this onward, I think, um, yeah. yeah. I thank think you very much, Jessica. That was, that was an excellent um, overview of, of the book with theoretical and empirical uh, context. Well, we move on to Didam Soy Altın Koyela. She's an assistant professor of political science and, uh, at uh, Altınbaş University and also a board member of Transparency International in, in Turkey. So um, yes, uh, and uh, as already Rahime had mentioned, she wrote on the enlargement strategy of the EU and providing a framework for analysis of uh, the Europeanization of in Turkey. Yes. Thank you. Hey, hi everyone. It's really great to be part of this project. So um, in our chapter with Rahime, 
so we were a bit, you know, thinking about what was the, what the title should be. So we put first Europeanization, then said, okay, maybe we should also put de Europeanization in the beginning. You know, I guess it covers much better what's happening in Turkey in, in you know, a couple of the last, last years, right? So in our chapter, we want to present the, you know, uh, the analytical framework for the, for the authors, especially, the, you know, the ones having an empirical analysis. So we define the mechanisms of Europeanization. I guess, you know, people who are familiar with this literature, they know it already, right? It's conditionality-based, social learning-based mechanisms, and also lesson-driven change, right? And we also define some um, the positive, uh, negative, and selective change, the possible outcomes. So I guess it's sort of a you know roadmap for the authors so they can um, pick it up whether it is relevant for their empirical analysis. So in this way, I guess we left it free for the authors to come up with some scope conditions, I guess, which is the added value of the book. You know, it can be with different veto players, different epistemic communities, political culture, or different adaption costs in different policy areas. So I guess, I mean, when I look at the chapters, we see that it, it worked very well. Um, so in the book, we define three mechanisms. I, you know, a couple of words maybe on that, you know, a change, domestic change, you know, as a result of Europeanization can be interest driven, you know, cost benefit calculation, which sort of happened in Turkey when the Europeanization process was credible, let's say, at least until 2000 and maybe six, seven. But it can also be, you know, driven by social norms, you know, learning, which is, I guess, more, you know, have some long term implications. It, that not that much shallow. Um, and also it can be lesson driven when governments are not that much satisfied with the status quo. And in Turkish case, I, I guess it was the case in, in the violence against women. Um, and I will come to that moment, uh, the point in a moment. Uh, we also define the outcomes. I guess it's important to differentiate between norm adoption, which is you know legal, formal uh, adoption. Uh, generally, happens in many countries. In Hungary, Poland, Rahim already mentioned the sex sliders, so they also came up with these formal reforms. But since they didn't come up with the norm application, which is our second level of change, so they start to backslide after membership happens, right? Uh, in Turkish case, that's sort of the same, you know, generally adopt, we see adoption of legal um, codes, but they are not being implemented uh, properly uh, in practice, uh, which is generally lacking. So we talk about shallow Europeanization. Um, negative, positive, it can also be Europeanization. I guess negative Europeanization or de-Europeanization is uh, capturing um, what's happening in Turkey lately, at least in some issue areas, and this, I guess, takes us to selective Europeanization, cherry picking, you know, some of the authors, I guess, in the book already mentioned it. So while we are giving this analytical sort of framework to the, uh, to the authors, we also examined how gender policies of EU evolved over time. So we look at different enlargement uh, ways, you know, southern enlargement, northern enlargement, and try to see uh, how gender policies, how gender norms in EU are sort of a moving target. So it obviously has some implications for cases like Turkey, which you know had a higher misfit in terms of gender norms. A couple of words on Turkey, maybe uh, before I finish. So I guess in Turkish case, maybe you know authors showed in their chapters more explicitly, but uh, in our chapter, we you know try to take a broad uh, analysis on on Turkish case in terms of gender equality. So we see that conditional debate mechanisms to large extent explain legal reform especially in employment policy, you know, social policy, which is not that much touching to cultural side or conservative side of the government. So they are quite selective in that sense. Uh, but there is also, I guess, some policy dissatisfaction, uh, which became sort of a triggering uh, factor for government, you know, to come up with more legislation, especially, you know, prevention of violence or a signature of Istanbul Convention. So I guess it is sort of an ignored point in, you know, in Turkish case, generally too much emphasis on conditionality, but not that much, you know, we don't see that much empirical evidence on lesson drawing model. So this book, I guess, contributing to this uh, ignored point in that sense, you know, bringing evidence how uh, lesson drawing model can also lead, uh, can also lead some norm adoption, like happened in Turkish case. Um, second point, I guess, in, about Turkey, the government is quite selective, having sort of a familiaristic approach. Uh, gender scholars, I guess, know much better what I, what I say, you know, having more conservative approach when they are uh, taking on uh, gender equality policies, you know, ignoring LGBT rights, for example. Too much focus on conservative family-related 
side of the story, but ignoring the other side. Um, so they are promoting anti-egalitarian, uh, let's say, gender politics under the concept of gender justice. So some of the authors I see in the book took up this point and you know, they elaborated on that, how different non-governmental organizations close to government are promoting gender justice vis-a-vis -vis to gender equality, which is, I guess, a bit problematic. But still, we conclude the chapter with a, with a sort of a positive note. Um, so we said that, you know, okay, this is selective sort of reform process going on in Turkey, a bit sort of shallow. But still, I guess there is the, you know, empowerment of women organizations, women NGOs in Turkey, which are not that much comfortable with this selective reform process. So they demand more. So they want more reforms on not only in employment, social policy, but also, you know, covering the cultural aspects touching to gender equality, not gender justice, and also ex expecting more impl implementation in the practice. Um, so this is, a this is a potential, I guess, in the future um, for you know, long-term implications, let's think about in that way. Um, you know, maybe it will change, and change things in practices, ways of doing things in Turkey about you know, how we approach gender equality norms. Um, and as we already saw recently, um, so this women NGOs, sort of rose up against government when they decided to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention. So this is the de Europeanization, right? And they, they sort of stopped this uh, backsliding. So I guess that's still, you know, some kind of uh, hopeful uh, note in Turkish case. You know, this is selective, shallow approach in, in many ways. But still, I guess there is an unexpected, I would say, the empowerment of, you know, these women NGOs demanding more than this. So we finished the chapter with this positive note, and we are happy to see there are some authors in the book to you know, pick up this point and elaborate on more. I guess I'll stop here. Maybe we will talk more in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, and we move on with Melis Jin uh, from University of Lancaster. Um, and sh her chapter offers um, a feminist critique and the framing of uh, Europeanization. So Melis, Yes, the floor is yours. Alternative explanations from feminist theories towards the feminist framework for the Europeanization process. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Hi, thank you. Um, so, as Rahima mentioned um, in this book, one of the key questions that we seek to respond was whether the EU can be a feminist actor. So that was the overall arching, you know, overarching question that we aim to answer. So we looked at different policy areas that speak of how the Europeanization of Turkey, um, to Turkey took place in the field of gender policies, why it failed, and how it should be coupled with a feminist framework. So our contributors will speak about some of these policy areas today, but. What I will do is that I will focus on the feminist critique. So in this work, we offer a feminist critique of interest and norm-driven models of Europeanization, which Rahima has briefly mentioned. Therefore, I will not go through them again, but um, I will highlight that our feminist critique draws on the work of feminist philosophers. And of course, it's difficult sort of uh, in this short span of time, it's difficult to elaborate um, all these feminist philo uh, philosophers, but we focus on philosophers such as Honora O'Neill's non idealized um, abstraction of justice, which accounts for the identification of deception and coercion of the rights and questions the vulnerability and legitimacy of consent. Actually, this frame is quite important for our work because it argues as to exactly how we can ensure that policies and directors and uh, directors of the EU favor marginalized voices, for instance, poor women or women of marginalized ethnic communities, because such women may rely on others and may not have independence. And they may not be able to set their own terms, which may effectively force them to accept the proposals of the more uh, powerful. And likewise, our feminist critique is also informed by the sexual contract um, theory of Carol Petman, which posits how men occupy authoritative and decision-making roles in politics, economy, and judiciary. And here, these contracts refer to men's government of um, women in modern societies and make the implication that contemporary societies are fraternal and contractual patriarchies. And this master and subject model actually offers an analysis of institutionalized and power relations that leave little uh, room for women to enter the men's club. And we also refer to work of Marta Nussbaum um, to argue what matters is not the equality of opportunities, but the equality of outcomes created by the policies and the necessity to look at the extent women are able to use the resources and opportunities 
offer to them to enjoy the same level of freedom with men. So we also um, draw on the work on, you know, uh, and Flips and, and um, Nancy Fraser, and we bring all these feminist philosophers in dialogue with each other to really unpack them, this um, ultra-centric nature of um, Europeanization and uh, the policies and of um, Europe on, on gender equality that's just like sort of um, you know imposed on both the, you know EU member states but also also the candidate states. So the book actually makes five key arguments regarding how feminist Europeanization should look like. But I will not you know I will not go through all these five arguments. But I will highlight only one of them to question the role of EU as a feminist actor. So um, and in the book we critique the approach of treating women's rights as human rights. So this is one of the arguments that I will focus on, um, you know, sort of giving a feminist critique of um, human rights approach. So we argue that actually gender equality should be based on equality of outcomes, um, opportunities, and substan uh, substantive positive and negative freedoms. So gender equality policies of the EU have mostly been driven via a human, uh, human rights framework that aims to provide a strong language in directive and legislation to advocate gender equality. And one of such examples actually can be seen in the requirement of the common security defense policy missions and operations, um, which stipulate that um, they should integrate either a human rights expert or a gender expert, rather than making gender an expert a requirement. And the EU's this adding in of women as a tick boy exercise actually deprioritizes, uh, de sorry, so many, um, sort of um, ignores the importance of gender expertise in its policy documentation activities. So we argue that such an approach does not necessarily help to create a more social um, order or redistribute resources or power in alignment with the notions of gender equality. And the, the problematic aspect of, you know, like seeing these through human rights is also is that um, the, the human rights approach associates empowerment with legal documents and equal citizenship. Uh, and the Europeanization adopts this as a process of embedded gender equality in the reforms of social institutions that perpetuate inequalities. Yet granting equal rights does not necessarily empower women because as we all know that as women, you know, like we're not always considered equal partners to men in democracies. And it also does not deconstruct the power dynamics, hierarchies and gender inequalities that deprive women from exercising their so-called equal rights and it excludes them from political life by circumscribing their contribution to public deliberation or decision making. So the EU actually treats human rights as a pathway to achieve gender equality, and this manifests itself in its low commitment to the cause and its inability to create gender awareness in candidate countries like Turkey. So it is often forgotten that legalistic solutions improve women's lives only a limited degree because many countries only grant rights in a rhetorical sense. And the measures um, in actually should consider whether women have access to these rights and should involve transformation and reforms in social institutions that perpetuate gender-based inequalities. So the underlying gender equality principle for Europeanization should not revolve around the concept of rights as one can rightfully ask the question of what the point of having abstract rights is if you cannot secure whatever it is you have. So there should be a factor rule of law with law enforcement and law enforcement, as you all know, needs law enforcers who are assigned um, to, to specific ties to act. So as on Honore O'Neill would argue, there is no effective accountability um, of public administration without institutions that allocate the tasks and the responsibilities and hold specified office holders to account. So the EU should do more than passing legislation in order to ensure that they see rights as normative rather than inspirational. I mean, this being said, and I want to highlight that we're aware that bodies like the EU are not corollaries of human rights and they do not assign states the direct obligation to respect rights, but only second order obligations to secure them. So this is why actually challenging gender equalities um, at times remains at the rhetorical level, but still we believe that economical, ethical, historical and representational factors and social and political economic opportunities should be rearranged in such a way to close the gender parity in every aspect of life. 
So going back to this very key question we ask, whether the EU can be a feminist actor, and drawing on the, you know, like um, in the book, these in-depth, um, you know, like a philosophical debates that we have in relation to gender justice theories and how these impinge on Europeanization policies, I have to say that we can not confidently say the EU is a feminist actor. I mean, the chapters in this book, the empirical work um, in this book show that gender power structures are embedded in representation, policymaking processes and institutions, and symbolic representations pays only lip service to Europeanization agenda, which um, Burju Tashkan will uh, briefly talk about. So the EU does not have a robust and comprehensive gender equality policy agenda, and consequently gender inequality is constantly reproduced in its gendered institutional structure. And our analysis also indicates that reforming these old institutions and adopting this ad woman and stir approach is problematic because adding women into strongly gendered structures further marginalizes their roles and prevents even um, at the parliament level, like consider the MPs from acting together, even on issues um, related to women's problems, as, as you would see Istanbul Convention. So the EU does not lay specific policy ideas on how to challenge the male leadership or hegemony or power issues that dominate policymaking. And in the absence of clear accountability and, for, and enforcement, the promises and the long-term aims of ensuring gender equality unfortunately falls on the shoulders of women rights, feminists, and um, you know, these women rights um, organizations. So we believe that the EU's transition into a feminist actor requires the EU to create feminist institutions and update its decision-making mechanisms with a feminist consciousness, which will pay off not only in the field of gender equality, but in a wide range of policies. So indeed, we consider EU as a progressive gender actor. And compared to other institutional organizations and regional unions, gender equality actually is a cross-cutting um, issue across different EU policy areas. And also the EU so, far, uh, EU so far is a leading body that invested considerably in advancing women's rights across in Europe and beyond. And in fact, both the empirical analysis and the theoretical um, engagements of this book and the earlier research on, you know, like in Europeanization of gender equality policies and gendering and Europe have found that the EU has served as the main initiator of the discussions on gender equality or empowering civil society organizations or even opening a window of opportunity for feminist movements who then use the EU as their justification um, on some non-binding issues um, of national agendas such as domestic violence or LGBT rights. However, we want to highlight that this does not necessarily make the EU a normative gender actor or a feminist actor, as the feminist rationale has never been the departure point of the EU, nor the underlying philosophical underpinning um, um, in the development of its, its gender equality policies. Um, for instance, I mean, uh, if we look into, you know, like deeply in this book, we will actually see that women's um, integration into labor markets was basically driven by the idea of um, maximizing economic development of the EU's gender equality approach. Or if you look into EU's um, to ENP countries, you know, the neighborhood um, sort of um, countries, you could see that um, the, the EU positioned most of the women in these countries as pawns for um, countering insurgents to minimize any security threats coming from, from, from these countries. So all this actually shows that um, um, unless uh, driven by a feminist understanding and my, by moving beyond the liberal concerns of feminism to consider issues such as recognizing the links um, between gender regimes and power structures and relations, the EU remains a progress factor for gender equality as it aims to improve women's right, uh, rights and livelihoods by correcting practices and policies, but not disrupting the underlying gender structures and power relations that generate them. So we highlight that unless is um, unless EU is a feminist actor committed to transformative changes within its borders and beyond, being a progressive actor at a rhetorical level will be an, an insufficient attempt to build a gender equal Europe. So I will, uh, you know, like stop here and then um, I will just like give the word to our sort of authors, um, you know, to elaborate on the empirical chapters. 
Thank you so much, Melis. In fact, I was preparing to show you the last one minute, um, you know, reminder. So, well, I think you as the editors, you deserve slightly, uh, you know, um, more words to expand on. So, but I will, I, I'm afraid I'll not be that generous to the contributors. Uh, so if we can just make it into five minutes, that will be perfect because, you know, there are very interesting talks that we're looking forward to. And we'll continue with Bukia Boschnak. Um, and she, she has written on the construction of a gender equality regime, the case of the European Union um, assistance in Turkey. And Bukia is an assistant professor of international relations at Bilgi University. And yes, um, Bukia, please feel comfortable and relaxed. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. Yes, the floor is yours. <laughs> Ebru. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, our editors, actually, Rahime and Melis, because they uh, supported us enormously throughout this pro process. And I have learned a lot from their uh, discussion and feedback as well. So I am very, very happy to be part of this pr project. Uh, my chapter titled Construction of a Gender Equality Regime, the case of the European Union assistant in Turkey. So basically there is a question mark uh, by asking the question of the construction of the gender equality regime, because in here I try to show that EU tries to actually establish a gender equality regime. And as you know, our other contributors shows that it is actually a progressive actor. Uh, this is also evident in the various uh, policy the, the documents, but this is a very selective understanding of gender equality. And in this book, uh, we all together try to employ a critical lens and try to sh show that in you know, various different empirical world, this is the case, that there is a selective understanding of gender equality and we need to ch challenge this selective understanding of gender equality. So how do I do that? Uh, basically, uh, I focus on the discursive feminist policy literature. This is, uh, there is a lot of work about this lit uh, literature in the European context. And my chapter focuses on how gender equality is basically approached and framed by the EU in Turkey by looking at the different types of the policy documents in relation to the civil society. Why civil society? Because there are, uh, it is an important actor throughout the enlargement process, and there are a lot of funding to civil society. Even there are, you know, problems in the governmental level, EU level relationship. Actually, we still see that this relationship between and interaction between the civil society and the EU is still ongoing. And actually, uh, there is, I mean, you can challenge this, but there is, you know, actually a important relationship at that level. So basically in this chapter, I argue that uh, EU follows an integrationist approach to gender mainstream uh, streaming. Uh, by uh, this integrationist approach basically means that uh, gender mainstreaming is adopted as an instrumental strategy to achieve the existing policy goals. So this instrumentality is really, really important in here. So uh, basically uh, through the analysis of the different policy documents, I found that there are three gender equality frames. Uh, first one is the gender equality as an economic empowerment. Uh, second one is the gender equality as the human rights. And the final one is the gender equality as a democratic democracy promotion. Uh, when we look at other chapters as well, I think this finding is also compatible with the uh, findings of the other chapters as well. Uh, while there are, you know, differences and divergences in this, you know, uh, different frames, uh, these frames are also important because when we look at the, uh, our book, they share a similar rational of the Europeanization. Again, they reflect an instrumental rather than a feminist understanding of Europeanization, uh, where a substantive normative commitment to gender equality is not embedded in the text. Uh, we can we can discuss these different uh, types of frames in the 
Q&A section. I don't want to spend more time on that. Uh, but in here, the most important finding is a economic empowerment is a master frame. So it is the most common frame that we see in the uh, civil society document and other uh, documents and other policy documents as well. Uh, when we, I want to talk about the literature as well a little bit and the methodology because I think uh, in this work the methodological part is really really important. Uh, actually my research like combines three uh, different strands of the literature. These are different but at the same time interconnected with each other. First one is the debates on the gender mainstreaming in the EU. I use this literature in order to understand the EU's approach to gender equality, because actually this literature already tells us that there is a specific approach. This is very well known, but I wanted to see how this, is, this manifest, manifests itself in the Turkish context. And then uh, Europeanization approach was our common approach throughout the book. So that is, uh, that needs no more explanation. And EU, uh, the literature on the EU aid to civil society. Uh, and again, I told why civil society is important in this sense. Methodologically, a critical frame analysis is really important. Uh, and I think this is the contribution of this chapter. Uh, critical frame analysis, uh, this have been widely used in the European context. Uh, this is a feminist research method and actually it provides the methodological tools to study the meaning of the uh, gender uh, equality through the different dimensions of the policy frame. Okay. And why important to do this work? Why important to employ the critical frame uh, analysis? I think uh, it is important at two levels. I am finishing in one minute. At the theoretical level, uh, this work shows how interests are constructed within the policy cycles. And at the empirical level, uh, the Tur Turkish case actually is important to understand this dualism between the EU's democracy pr uh, promotion, to, uh, sorry, EU promotion of gender equality and the mainstream uh, agenda. Okay, I will finish here. Thank you so much. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. Sorry for interruption, Buke. That's okay. Uh, and also, I, I really appreciate that you informed us about the methodology. And, you know, this is where all these abstraction comes to something much more concrete. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. And we, I think we move on with the empirical chapters right now. And we start with Elif Uzgaran. I can't. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was I was just looking for um, Elifuz Goran and yes, now she's here with us. And um, she is a lecturer at the Department of International Relations at Dokuzeli University and she's written on internationalism and Europeanization the struggle over gender equality and uh, on women's rights and feminist movements in Turkey. That will be her empirical contribution. Yes, Elif, please. Of hey. course. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Ebrojam. And please let me know when I have one minute. Uh, okay. Uh, I also would like to thank two editors. Uh, they were very understanding within the process. The, uh, their feedback uh, was very important for me to further uh, develop the chapter. Uh, yes, I had um, an empirical focus in this chapter, uh, I had some interviews when I was doing my PhD back in 2010. Uh, I interviewed uh, women activists in Turkey uh, about membership and globalization. Then uh, when I was speaking with Rahime, uh, I was thinking about the book and the chapter. I was think I, I thought that I could repeat interviews, which can be interesting because uh, now it was um, in 2019 and the context, uh, it changed can be discussed, but it was a different context. So in uh, 2010, it was very much uh, still the European Union reform process. That was the political mood. But in uh, 2019, uh, the the historical context was described with the globalization, the Europeanization, uh, Eurozone crisis, uh, the attractiveness of EU membership diminished, 
uh, so it was um, for the gender mainstreaming, let's say, uh, it was not that uh, conducive, not in the EU level, not in the Turkish level. Uh, so it was very different uh, in that sense. And uh, I, that was one of my aims in the chapter to understand continuity and change. Uh, so uh, it was like repeating interviews at two, at two different decades, let's say. Uh, and the aim, and this is the second aim of the chapter, to, to uncover changes and continuities over the last two decades. Uh, my first aim was to historicize women's rights feminist movements in order to understand how they conceive emancipation at different historical periods and to see the links with the international level. Uh, so we have first wave, second wave, uh, third wave uh, of internationalism, let's say, and how uh, these uh, waves were effective to shape the agenda and the understanding of emancipation for women activists in Turkey. Uh, so this chapter basically had two aims. One to historicize to understand different conceptions of emancipation. And second, this is mostly the part that I present my empirical findings to discuss changes and continuities. Uh, I had 14 interviews. Uh, most of them were conducted to, back in 2010. Uh, I tried to figure out institutions. So for instance, I interviewed um, an activist from Kader, Association for uh, Support of Training, um, Support and Training of Human Candidates, a Socialist Feminist Collective, Kamer, uh, Capital City Women's Platform, uh, Chada Shesham, Association for Supporting Contemporary Life. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with Shirin Tekele, for instance. Uh, it was very important for me that interview back in 2010. Then I repeated some of the interviews. Um, I don't want to go into details of the uh, presentation of the chapter because I know this is not uh, like a workshop presentation. Um, I want to finish with my conclusions. Uh, so basically I asked uh, how has the struggle at the international and European level contributed to Turkey's movement? That was the first question. And uh, whether we have changes and continuities in the last decade, that was the second major question in the chapter. Um, and to, to conclude uh, on the basis of the interviews, the international level has always been a very decisive reference point for uh, Turkey's uh, activists. Um, that was one outcome in the, uh, one of the conclusions in the uh, interviews, in the empirical study. But uh, in particular, European Union was a very important reference point, especially in 2000s, uh, because before the regular reports were published, they mentioned me uh, that uh, before the uh, regular reports were published, for instance, a uh, European women's lobby was very effective uh, to make gender a mainstream issue. So in all the reform process, all these chapters, uh, a gender perspective was incorporated so EU uh, as a norm agent, let's say, uh, was here effective to make gender a mainstream issue. Uh, however, uh, as uh, Melis mentioned, EU is not perceived as a feminist actor. Uh, and there are some criticisms like uh, bureaucracy, for instance, uh, project management and bureaucracy. Uh, they mentioned that EU is very, has a very cumbersome project management, uh, that women at the local level has difficulties to approach and to understand and then to benefit from these funds, for instance, that was a critique. Uh, another critique is related to it maybe to resonate with Melis's argument on the feminist uh, critique and outcomes, uh, employment situation in Turkey. Women employment, EU is mostly silent on women employment, which is like 30%, 30, 34, 35 in the case of Turkey. Uh, and despite uh, positive economic rates, growth rates in 2000s in Turkish economy, women employment, we have, 
I, I think we have very few uh, progress in women employment. EU average is around 75%. Uh, and the EU is silent on that, for instance, uh, which is, again, from a feminist point of view, an outcome that the EU um, is missing. That was another critique of the interviews. It's possible to have two uh, to observe two changes, uh, and I'm gonna finish here. Uh, especially in the last debate, uh, the EU turned a blind eye to democratic backlash. That was a critique of the uh, interviewees uh, about the process, uh, mostly in relation to these negotiations on migration and Syrian refugee crisis they mentioned. Um, and uh, the expectations that the EU will promote Turkey, democracy in Turkey were paralyzed. However, uh, the interviews finished with some optimism because not only in Turkey, but in the European level, this is a slow, long process, uh, the achievements of women. Uh, so this, this decade of reform, they say, created a memory and left a legacy uh that uh, we that that women activists continue to refer to this legacy and to these changes at the uh, legislation uh, as a, the eu continues to be a reference point but for sure its normative power uh, declined many thanks thank you very much uh, elif um that was i think a, like a very clear um summary of your findings and the major argument and i'm glad that you ended up with the normative power or the much debated normative power of the eu on on turkey on gender equality and empowerment in turkey and this is still an open and a question and of course there is a lot of i think this is my gut feeling there is a lot of room for improvement in that sector i must you know sadly confess right okay so we can go on with burju burju tashkin um has written on cherry picking uh, her title is cherry picking in policy making and the eu's presumptive roles on uh, gender policy making in turkey and she is an assistant professor at Istanbul Medeniyet University at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration. Yes, Burju, um, we can we can start with you. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'm very happy and honored to be a part of this project, I should say. And uh, I also want to congratulate the editors, uh, Rahima and Melis, uh, because they did an excellent work in combining all these different chapters under a related framework and theory. And, and um, same for this chapter, I should say. Uh, my chapter, uh, Chair Picking in Policymaking, is mainly focusing on women representation in Turkey at national level. And the paper argues that this increase in representation in the early 2000s has emerged because of three main factors. The first one was the women movements, of course, in the 1990s, especially within the Kurdish and Islamic movement groups. And then uh, the uh, domestic institutional factors, such as the party system uh, and competition, uh, has an impact on the increase of uh, female representation in the parliament. And the third one, the third factor was the European Union accession uh, process in which the older parties give uh, support to this process. On the other hand, the, uh, the paper questions why, although there's an increase in the female representation in the parliament, uh, the party members, especially the, the women representatives, uh, has problem in coming to a consensus, about, especially about the women's rights and uh, women's role in the society and uh, as an answer i i tried to um, I, I in fact i stated that the first one is the high polarization in the society high political polarization, polarization in the society the second uh, factor is high level of uh, party discipline and the third one is the majoritarianism especially which has increased with the transition to presidential system uh, and the fourth factor is the is that, of course, Turkey's European Union process is uh, something like coming to the halt. And uh, Turkey, at this point, also changed its policy towards European Union. Uh, and this book argues that from the interest-driven approach, uh, when it's taking and ap applying the gender policies regarding the European Union directives or um, conventions, Turkey changed it from an interest-driven policy to 
um, a norm-driven uh, uh, approach. So, uh, in fact, in the last chapter, um, uh, Rahime and Milis are arguing that in European Union candidate states or member states, uh, they also applied uh, Alison Woodward's theory, the velvet triangle, saying that uh, as, the, as there are much, uh, much number of um, Democrats in European Union, in civil society, in interest groups, and in governments, uh, we see that this process is going in a more velvet way. Uh, but I should say that the Turkish uh, example model is not something like a velvet triangle, but it resembles an iron square, <laughs> I should say, uh, in which the fourth corner is religion. So that's why uh, Turkish government during this process is applying this cherry picking policy, adopting some of the policies which are in relevant or in accordance with its own uh, ideology and trying to ignore and exclude the other directives and policies, articles of European Union, which is against its uh, own conservative uh, policy. So, um, um, but, uh, so in this paper, in fact, I also use the empirical model in order to understand women's representation and uh, what were the factors that increase it uh, for Turkey. So I, I made a model like taking all this um, number of female group, female representatives in the parliament starting from 1935, uh, which was the first time the Turkish woman entered to the parliament uh, until the last elections, 2018. And it showed that as the competition, competition increases between the parties according to the elect election system, a uh, woman has less chance to be elected in the parliament. The other factor is party system. Uh, I argue that if the party system changes from a more competitive to a more stable political system, then women are more likely to be elected in the parliament. But of course, this doesn't mean that there should be a single uh, government, single party government, or there should be a dictatorship in the Turkey in order to have high level of uh, women. Uh, it also shows that uh, stability is important, but on the other hand, if the seats in the parliament are delivered uh, between the more number of parties, then again, we see an increase in the number of women. So in fact, this was an empirical study saying that institutional factors also matters for the female representation, not only the social and economic factors, but also institutional factors matters. The other in the, I also look at the uh, CAFEC uh, reports in order to measure the polarization between the uh, parties and female members, uh, female deputies. Uh, it also shows that ideology, I mean, gender issue is just in the middle of Ideal, ideological differences. So even CAFEC says that women issue and gender issues above uh, ideology, it is not. It is just in the middle of uh, the ideological polarization uh, and also the social cleavages such as between the secularists and Islamists in Turkey. Uh, so the second uh, table I look at was, look. I mean, it was looking at the parliamentary work of the women um, deputies in the Turkish parliament for the recent uh, two parliaments. Uh, and it shows that uh, especially the uh, women representative deputies of the incumbent party or the incumbent alliance, now let's say, were less active compared to uh, opposition parties members. So as a result, uh, we should say that uh, the Pius woman, Pius or uh, the member of the incumbent parties should be more active in the parliament uh, and they should uh, be more inclusive towards the opposition uh, members, opposition representatives, uh, especially for the uh, gender uh, equality policies. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much. That's all. Um, that was also another very interesting um, field study and the representation of your findings and that will be very interesting to look at all your tables and findings in the chapter. Uh, is it possible um, if I just add one sentence? I'm sorry, I just forget it. Okay. But uh, even I said, I mean, the chapter's name is like cherry picking. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, I, I should uh, state that 
um, Turkish government is taking European Union as the main model example uh, for the gender policies as well. So even uh, it's the relations are has come to come to halt. Uh, still, European Union is uh, the main model. Uh, I should emphasize. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so another, I think, um, important conclusion about the normative powerness of the European Union for for Turkish case. Well, um, and our last. Um, Contributor will be Mine Afacan Fındıklı and uh, I think Ayfer Ustabaş is also here, but I think um, who is going to be talking, Me. I don't know. I mean, just hey, thank you very much, yes. Uh, so this is a co-authored co chapter on gender inequality from a slightly different perspective that deals with the business sector. Um, and it talks about women managers and the resilience, issue of resilience and the gender norms in Turkey. Uh, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Before I start, I, on behalf of my colleagues Duygu and Ayfer, I would like to thank our editors, Rahime and Melis, for providing us the opportunity of being a part of this meaningful book project. With my colleagues, we work in business management, economics, and international trade, and we have genuinely benefited from taking part in this book since this study forced us to think in a broader perspective than the individual, business, and micro fields we work in. It was a real learning process for us, and they supported us so much. Thank you again. As we all know, gender inequality is built on biological sex characteristics and nurtured by the roles and responsibilities assigned to women and men within the framework of social and cultural norms, especially in less developed, and developing countries such as Turkey, gender inequality shows itself distinctly in the participation of working life, economical life. As a matter of fact, according to Global Gender Report of the World Economic Forum 2020, our country ranks 136 among 153 countries in this context. For this reason, being sensitive to this worrying issue in this book, we studied gender inequality in businesses and resilient gender norms. Our chapter aimed to reveal the process of adoption and application of the EU's gender equality norms in Turkey in, uh, using interest-driven and norm-driven approach. Based on this, we have first articulated and discussed our findings of semi-structure interviews with 24 female managers in automotive sector. We selected this sector because this sector may be called as gendered sector. There are mostly men managers in Turkey who are currently working in this sector. We asked participants to reveal the obstacle they faced in their, colleague, uh, in their career about being a woman manager, whether they were faced with any inconvenient behavior from their colleagues, their senior manager, how they maintain the balance between work and private life. And we identified, um, unfortunately, gender pay gaps, glass ceiling syndrome, work-life imbalance, occupational gender segregation, and sexual harassment, which reflect problems associated with gendered institutions. We have eventually encountered society's patriarchal mindset, evaluating women as child care, elderly care providers, and homemakers. In our chapter, we revealed three terms under two dimensions. In the first dimension, in the concrete and visible part of the society, the characteristics attributed to women have emerged like motherhood and housework roles. In the second and hidden part of society, we have encountered the prejudice against women and gender perceptions that have been transferred from the society to family and to the individuals through traditions since childhood. We have noticed that the norms and values, which are called informal institutions, can have negative effects on setting and maintaining the practices of formal institutions. They can resist structural reforms and even compete with them, particularly in countries like Turkey, where gender inequality is explicit. Cultural norms are deeply rooted in socioeconomic and political structure. 
That's why it's so crucial to ponder and show efforts in this context. Consequently, we state that although Turkey tries to fulfill the conditions set by the EU in terms of women's rights and gender equality, the non-institutional application process by informal structures, such as value, traditions, norms, proceed more difficult concerning the religious cultural characteristic of Turkey, and they still resist the change. Thus, we conclude that gender equality efforts can only have successful results with the collaboration between formal and informal institutions. We believe that we contribute to this book by addressing the role of resilient cultural norms and drawing attention to the challenges during the norm application process. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is a very interesting, um, you know, and also cross-cutting, you know, uh, chapter um, that brings two different disciplines on political science and, and business. Apparently there is a glass ceiling in every sector for, for women. So this is actually one of the challenges that we cannot overcome with, you know, alone. So we need manpower. <laughs> Um, at least in serious education. We know, I don't know if I'm allowed to do it, Rahime, but we also have another contributor of this, uh, of this brilliant book here with us. Uh, and he is the only male contributor of the, of the volume. And he did, uh, apparently he didn't want to talk about his chapter, but you know, thank you very much again, Dimitris, for, uh, for being with us. That was, that is very meaningful, okay. So I don't want to put any pressures because I'm extremely good in doing that. So um, I think we have covered uh, many interesting aspects of, you know, Europeanization uh, from feminist studies perspective. And I want to give the last floor to Ebru Turhan, um, who is our discussant today. And she's an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Turkish German University in Istanbul. Uh, and she serves as a senior research fellow at the Institute for um, European Politics in Berlin, which I used to work for some time when I was young and, you know, a PhD student. So it is great to see IEP um, on, on your brief uh, bio. Okay, Evro, I think you have um, a very hard task to accomplish right now. Um, you can take as much time as you want. Um, it will be very hard for you to sort of, you know, limit all these brilliant works into a couple of sentences, piece uh, of comments. Yes, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ebru Hojam. Uh, it's also very nice to see the, also the IEP connection uh, among us uh, alongside our names. Um, and um, yes, you're right. I mean, I think uh, it's not easy to sort of, you know, condense all these different, you know, aspects of this brilliant and pioneering book like you know uh within like you know a limited time but i think i will focus on a few aspects you know not to overbore you and uh, yesterday when we were doing our test you know uh sort of uh um, yeah zooming uh, rahima was mentioning that uh, you know uh, unintentionally that i had like 55 uh, minutes of like you know time but, uh, you know, I will not make use of this, you know, <laughs> the time and overdo my authority. Um, of course, you know, um, coming from, from a slightly different sort of yet uh, complementary, I would say, background, right? Like uh, with a keen focus on the different aspects of EU-Turkey relationship, um, uh, I would like to try to provide kind of like a complementary elaboration on this very exciting, you know, project in the next few uh minutes uh, of course as that i'm mainly focusing on the turkey relationship uh, the different aspects but since uh, i have uh, bec become acquainted with rahime uh, she is also uh, progressively integrating me into this uh, you know area or field of gender studies and we have some upcoming actually uh, research projects uh, with her so i'm very happy to be here and to have been invited uh, alongside all these great uh, contributors. So in this context, I would like to briefly discuss the three interconnected from my side or from my point of view uh, issues or aspects of this edited volume, which uh, contributes uh, to the literature from my point of view in 
three different, uh, you know, uh, key aspects or uh, perspectives. Uh, so the first one would be the overarching uh, contribution of the volume at hand to European studies. The second one would be the contribution of the volume to the state of art understanding and inquiry of EU-Turkey relations and the future uh, trajectory. And the third one would be um, I would uh, try to probably identify a few avenues, uh, avenues for future research agenda for EU-Turkey studies at the intersection of European studies uh, on the one hand and international relations on the other, based on the key findings and scope uh, of analysis of the volume at hand. So when we look at the overarching, you know, contribution of the uh, volume to European studies, I would like to mention two elements. First of all, I would like to uh, put an emphasis on the aspect of interdisciplinarity and cross-sectionality. You know, um, I think the highly and remarkably um, interdisciplinary approach of the volume deserves a great attention and also admiration, uh, also from my side. Uh, you know, interdisciplinarity and cross-sectionality have long been actually utilized as highly popular uh, buzzwords uh, for studying the EU, yet uh, from my point of view and experience, we rarely see uh, works or scholarly works uh, such as this volume by uh, Rahim and Melis which uh, you know rest on such a thorough and multi-layered and complex execution of uh, the buzzwords of interdisciplinarity and you know intersectionality at both theoretical conceptual uh, but also empirical levels of uh, analysis so at the theoretical level, level when we look at the book at hand the volume has offered a distinct I would say, uh, amalgamation of the Europeanization approach on the one hand and the feminist theory on the other in order to put forward a novel uh, conceptual approach to study the extent and also domestic consequences of the EU's extraterritorial rule promotion in third countries. At the empirical level, um, this very compounds uh, theoretical framework, which was uh, a, a sort of conceptualized by uh, Melis and Rahime and uh, Didam, uh, has been applied to EU-Turkey interactions in selected issue areas. So when we look at the volume at hand, I think also the respective individual chapters uh, studying various subcases. Uh, bring us uh, full circle to the starting point of this volume and its very main message from my point of view, which is that Europeanization and the feminist theory should be treated as mutually inclusive approaches um, to studying the EU, its attempts at extraterritorial rule export, and its relations with non uh, member states. So another point I would like to uh, put emphasis on in terms of the book's um, contribution to European studies would be, uh, you know, this, um, you know, volume uh, in terms of its contribution to the European studies, uh, I would say the second uh, point or uh, yeah, aspect I would like to draw on is actually the inquiry of the key drivers causes, effectiveness, but also consequences, as Melis also mentioned, you know, uh, equality of outcomes, you know, the outcomes in terms of, you know, policy implementation of EU's norm transfer to third countries. So when we look at the existing scholarly works, you know, mostly examine um, uh, EU's norm transfer to third countries, you know, uh, by focusing on manifold explanatory variables, you know, such as, you know, uh, the extent and asymmetry of interdependence, politicization, attractiveness of in incentives, domestic conditions, and also communitarization of EU roles, so the existence of a strong uh, EU acquis communitaire. So, but when we look from the perspective of the book, I think uh, the feminist critic, you know, of Europeanization in this volume provides us with new insights uh, to study the drivers, enablers, but also, as Melis mentioned, you know, the consequences um, of norm diffusion 
and opens uh, new and exciting avenues uh, for future research. And here, particularly, what has been already mentioned, uh, you know, in the last 30 minutes by our uh, individual contributors, like keywords such as representation, you know, doing beyond passing legislation. Uh, enforcement, creation of norm diffusion, which pro promotes nor um, gender equality, you know, I think all these uh, different variables could uh, be used, you know, also in the upcoming, you know, uh, you know, uh, scholarly works as new uh, drivers or enablers to, you know, uh, make use of, you know, a better understanding of norm diffusion. And I think this is one of the key contributions of the volume uh, at hand. So when I come to the second level of my analysis, you know, the contribution of the volume to the state of art understanding of uh, an inquiry of EU-Turkey relations and its future uh, trajectory, uh, first of all, um, Rahim and Melissa and all the contributors have, I think, created a very timely contribution to examining the ever evolving um, EU-Turkey relationship. You know, this dynamic relationship is under the influence of quite new complexities uh, in these days, and also ambiguities, you know, and these new complexities are generating or have generated, I would say, this puzzling uh, co-presence or co-existence of both increased sectoral interdependencies on the one hand, uh, but also progressively diverging normative and geostrategic uh, preferences uh, between both EU and Turkey on the other. And uh, we should also add uh, the, 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 I would say, the comatous uh, status of Turkey's uh, accession process to this complex picture. So without a dynamic accession track, the EU's relations uh, with uh, Turkey uh, will most probably progressively resemble uh, the EU's relations with emerging um, other middle powers or emerging powers and become increasingly concerned uh, with the debates on important overarching questions of inter and transnational you know, cooperation, effective multilateralism, and so on. So this new emerging setup in EU-Turkey relationship actually requires um, attempts to go beyond the theories of European integration, actually, you know. In other words, you know, uh, we should utilize, you know, the explanatory value of both mainstream and up and coming IR theories and governance studies for EU-Turkey relations um, so that, you know, we could advance EU-Turkey relations or EU-Turkey studies as a field of analysis, you know, at the intersection of EU integration studies, IR and global governance studies. And I think here, the feminist critique, you know, of EU-Turkey relations offers us new avenues and lenses for studying this new um, emerging setup of EU-Turkey relations. So a second point I would like to, um, you know, emphasize in terms of the book's importance for this new, you know, dynamics, evolving dynamic, dynamics of EU-Turkey relationship is, uh, you know, the situation as regards policy transfer, you know, the, the question of policy uh, transfer, the question of Turkey somehow, you know, alignment with EU norms uh, or, you know, rules outside an accession framework. So when we look, you know, at the literature and we will talk about policy transfer or norm diffusion, uh, the existing uh, literature mainly draws on two types of norm export, right? On the one hand, as already mentioned by many actually contributors today, there is the hierarchical policy transfer by conditionality. And then on the other hand, there is more, you know, this horizontal inclusive bottom-up sort of norm transfer via uh, transgovernmental networking or, you know, uh, network governance based on actually this, you know, te more technocratic uh, or expert related or driven uh, cooperation at the operational level, which was also emphasized by many, I would say, uh, contributors today in terms of different issue areas, you know, uh, they had been uh, focusing on in their uh, contributions. So the ineffectiveness of EU conditions and Turkey's uh, waning uh, membership perspective 
uh, actually directs our attention to this current trends and future prospects of EU's rule of export to Turkey via network governance. Uh, so via a more horizontal, you know, type of policy transfer with the participation of multi-level actors. And here, I would like to argue also based on the findings of all the individual, you know, uh, chapters that the feminist critique of Europeanization of the volume with its particular focus on the meso and macro, micro level analysis, you know, and the inclusion of multi-level actors and uh, governance traits such as, you know, civil society as already been mentioned by Buke, for instance, or women's movements and so on, uh, provides us with a very val valuable insight, you know, into transgovernmental networking uh, between the EU and Turkey and the scope and limits of bottom-up norm import. So this will, I think, be a very important field of analysis for the future, for the very immediate future of EU-Turkey relationship, since the overarching macro-political, you know, environment is not that much uh, favorable, you know, or in favor of a very uh, stable cooperative relationship between both parties. We, we as, you know, scholars are going to increasingly uh, focus on this more operational, you know, technocratic, but also expert driven, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, level in order to sort of find a new alternative partnership framework between the EU and Turkey, which could foster to some extent a stable cooperative behavior between both parties, uh, because right now, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the overarching, uh, you know, picture, we cannot really talk about a very stable cooperative, uh, you know, behavior uh, between both uh, actors. Um, Last point, you know, even is for future uh, research, uh, maybe just a couple of sentences. The first would be, uh, you know, I was, you know, looking at the book today again and, you know, thinking about again about EU-Turkey relationship. Um, and also with regard to the contributions, uh, particularly by Melis, you know, talking about, you know, uh, rule-based relationships and uh, the situation of rule of law and so on. Um, <laughs> When we talk about, um, you know, the future of EU-Turkey relationship uh, and, you know, alternative partnership frameworks or um, models, uh, and when we talk among, you know, scholars who have been working on this issue for the last, you know, couple of years, we say we have, we are also uh, entering our very own deadlock, you know, how to sort of, in terms of how to sort of create an alternative partnership a framework uh, or, you know, a framework based on external differentiated integration between EU and a non-member state Turkey uh, outside an accession framework, which could still go beyond this transactional axis of cooperation, you know, which could still be to some extent rule-based. And here, I think I, I was, you know, thinking, uh, you know, uh, alone at home, you know, about this issue. And I think a, a very, you know, a feminist, a new feminist framework of the concept of differentiated integration, you know, could actually foster EU-Turkish relationship in terms of, you know, bringing the relationship again to this more rule-based uh, kind of, you know, uh, I would say uh, overarching framework. A second, I think, uh, avenue for future uh, research, uh, which could, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, bloom, you know, uh, following inspiration from this edited volume, could be, again, a more, uh, of, uh, you know, a stronger focus on this meso and micro level analysis. Of course, the book already uh, includes a very uh, great amount or number of, I would say, uh, contributions, you know, focusing on this micro level analysis. But in terms of also this book and other, you know, uh, um, articles I am uh, encountering in the recent years, I think one thing we are forgetting in, uh, is actually the public opinion sphere, right? You know, how is actually the public opinion in general, you know, uh, perceiving, particularly in third 
third countries, EU gender policies. I think this is also, this could be also another level of analysis. Um, and one last point uh, or, you know, suggestion from, uh, you know, myself would be probably, you know, uh, since uh, this book started already with a quite a uh, you know uh, deep and uh, complex layered you know analysis of this topic it could uh, taking turkey as a case study uh, it could actually move forward uh, by also including you know a more comparative analysis of european uh, gender policies you know and their implementation in various non member states to also get a better understanding or grasp of i would say the key drivers causes of gender related norm diffusion i think which still remains a understudied uh, field all in all, um, I think, I hope, I hope I haven't talked too much, uh, but I would like to congratulate uh, Rahim and Medis and all uh, contributors. And I also would like to uh, maybe say one last uh, sentence, uh, also drawing on what Rahim has said at the start of her actually speech, uh, you know, that this, you know, the, the production of this volume was a very democratic, actually, sort of, uh, you know, process, you know, this open call and then, you know, collecting and gathering, uh, you know, all these very, uh, you know, uh, distinguished uh, scholars together. Uh, I think this is something, uh, you know, many scholars could uh, take as a good uh, example, success story, uh, because most of us as, uh, you know, academics, we try to sort of, you know, create this elitist, you know, like, you know, call for applications within our small, you know, friendship circles and so on. Uh, I think, you know, taking risks and being democratic and opening the avenue to further, you know, researchers, uh, you know, is actually very important. And I think this book also contributed to that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. That was very extensive. Um, and I really appreciate on behalf of also the other authors and editors that um, that was like a very extensive and expansive um, commentary on you, Ebru. I mean, um, you really had a detailed outline almost of all the major, um, you know, um, dimensions of this book. Um, this is, of course, I, I know that, you know, to prepare an edited book takes at least two years. So as time goes by, uh, context changes, we have different priorities, different emergencies, and, uh, you know, things may change and there are like a lot of risks in, in, in the final outcome. Um, but I'm sure that as we in Turkey says, this pirinç will have received, um, you know, too much water. I don't know, Melis, you translated to your British uh, audience, right? Uh, we old school people say that daha çok devam edecek bu tartışma. Whatever. Um, well, <laughs> well, we have some comments and questions. Unfortunately, some of the audience has to leave. But as far as I see, there are um, two questions and.